Uh, we are delighted to have our speaker here this evening, and he's going to give us a um, talk on what he does and how he does it. Uh, there will be time at the end for questions. And then we take a fair chunk of time for just refreshments and a chance for people to chat with each other as well as ask questions of our speaker tonight. Uh, so that's it. Thank Thanks. you very much. I'm going to talk um, about my work, but uh, indirectly. Uh, and I'm going to talk about basically the lineage of printing uh, and how that has ended up in my lap. And, uh, you know, we are here in this mechanics hall where, where th this mechanics hall was built to support the people making things in this town. And, uh, and as it's just as important today as it was when they built this building. They built this building because they saw a loss of people actually using their hands to make things way back when it was built. And, and we see the same thing today, I think. Um, so this is kind of a s ridiculous uh, title, but um, it's... Uh, so, so this is a lineage of the history of printing, but then it ends up in my, in my lap. So this is a chart showing um, uh, the history of printing. Well, the history, the amount of time that we've been printing. So the, um, the, the first black line, the largest area is the time period, it's, it's a timeline, so it's the first flint weapons to the first cave drawings. That's 230,000 years of human development. Then the second red line is cave paintings to the, the time of the cave paintings to the hieroglyphics, 15,000 years. The third, the black line, the smaller one, as we're going down this in size, hieroglyphics to Roman letters, 5,000 years. Then the smaller square red is um, Roman letters to the invention of printing, 1,500 years. And then that little sliver down there at the bottom is, is the time it took for printing to spread throughout Europe as soon as it was invented. And the time that we've been, the time that we've been doing printing is only 570 years. So it's, you know, a fraction of that little red square. So, let's go back. Uh, yeah. So uh, prior to the invention of movable type, books were printed from wooden blocks. Um, these, this is a contemporary uh, place in, in China where this, these are the pages of books. So a book is ordered and they pull these blocks. These are woodcuts and every woodcut is one page. So they pull them all off and print them and it's, uh, you know, they, they, you, you order a, a Bible and you get one. And they, they just print them out of these, from these wood blocks. <clears throat> so Gutenberg is the beginning of movable type uh, in 1450 and is the beginning of my, the, 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 the technique that I use and printing as we know it. So... <clears throat> Basically what that is, is uh, a piece of metal, uh, lead, uh, that is in relief. And you can see how it's used here. Um, uh, it's a small piece of metal and each letter is on its own piece. And you just compose them to the words that you want. <coughs> uh, Gutenberg came up with this system. He also invented printing presses and printing ink and a number of other things that, that uh, contributed to the beginning of movable type. And like I said, the, 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 um, it only took a few years for that 
technology to spread throughout Europe. And you think about the time period that that was, 1450, what would it take, I mean, people didn't have cell phones. How did this, how did it spread from throughout Europe in that short amount of time? Gutenberg was best known for his uh, 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 42-line Bible, um, of which this is one page of it. So um, prior to him doing this, this page would have had to have been all carved out of wood, uh, all in one piece. <clears throat> so this is the earliest, uh, first known illustration of a printing press from a dance macabre in, from France, uh, carved, uh, well printed by Matthias Hus in 1499. So the, the dance macabre, w w it was a series of prints that showed every station of, of life, uh, of you know, every job that people had. Um, and each one of them had the, the death figure hovering over them, just basically, I mean, from the pauper to the king to the pope, every one of them had the, de the, 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 uh, the death um, was, was close to them. So death comes to us all, no matter how high we are, basically was the point. Um, <clears throat> so it's showing the beginnings of these printing presses. I put this on here just to show you this. It's, the printing press is in the middle. Um, and made out of wood with, with struts going up to the ceiling. And it was basically just a big screw press. So you pull the handle, the screw turns, and it pushes a flat surface down, makes the impression off the type. Um, this is a press of uh, Essentius in 1507. It shows the press a little bit better in this illustration. <coughs> So that's kind of that's a really short history of of <laughs> printing, really short. But get, you know, I just want to get the idea that this is part of my what I do. It's it's it, it has it is a lineage all the way up to those of us that do this today. Um, this illustration is so. So why is there so much printing in Maine? Uh, I, th um, I think that's an important thing to, th thing to think about. Um, this is a, uh, a banner from the, the it used to be owned by the mechanics hall, the mechanics, um, and then the, the mechanics would, would host a parade. And I don't know how many of you have seen these banners. They're at the, the, they're at the uh, uh, Maine Historical Society now, aren't they? Yes. And um, they're beautiful. They're beautifully hand-painted. And um, so each station of life, again, would have had a banner. And you'd march, and I guess they marched down the, the street and had a, had a parade. Uh, this one was for the, the printer. And um, it's a little hard to see. There's a printing press on the left and uh, I think another printing press on the right. So Archimedes lever, and that's the front of it. This is the back of it, the tyrant's foe and the people's friend. So, <laughs> so you know, th there was a lot of printing. There always has been a lot of printing in Maine, and there is a lot of printing in Maine again. Um, uh, not on the massive commercial level that it used to be, but... Uh, we have more letterpress printers in this town, in Portland, than, or in the surrounding area, than most, you know, you know large sections of the country. Um, one of the reasons that we historically have a lot of printing here is because we had the resources. And so, uh, the wood, the resources, the paper. So, this is a... Um, the, the raw materials, this is a log drive in Island Falls in 1895. So the logs were being taken out of Maine and, or, or being produced into things in Maine. So we had, we had lumber for building, but we had paper making and a number of other things that came out from the logs. Um, here's another 
an interesting photograph. This is a log drive on the Saco River in 1894. So our rivers, the fact that Maine has the rivers that come, that feed up into that resource, the log, the trees. So the trees would grow, they'd cut the trees, they'd put them in the rivers and they were brought down to the, the shore. And, and all along the coast is where the factories were and the paper mills and, and the, the, the ships and, that could carry them to other places. This is a beautiful, I had to show this, this is a, um, the companies that made paper in this, in this area in, in, in Maine. Um, this is the Continental Paper Company anniversary booklet, Rumford Falls, 1905. So there's a pretty good sized factory, a picture of one there. Um, so <clears throat> just some samples of what was made. Um, this is a picture of Rumford in 1900. It shows these companies, the Rumford Falls Sulfite Company, capable of producing 40 tons of sulfite pulp per day, Rumford Falls Paper Company, producing up to 60 tons of paper a day. That's a lot of paper. Fort Hill Chem Chemical Company, Continental Bag Company, producing one million papers, paper bags per day in 1900. Um, and that was that, that booklet that I just showed. International Paper Company and the Rumford Falls Envelope Company, all in that complex of right there in 1900. Uh, here's a shot of the St. Croix Pulp and Paper Company in Woodland, which is now Baileysville, in 1920 from an old uh, postcard. And here, you, I put this in because you can see the rail line. So we used to have a lot of rail lines that ran through Maine because they were pulling all of this raw material and these resources out of where they were being produced and bringing them to where they were needed, where they were sold. <clears throat> um, so the shipping of the materials, we, had, we have that. We had the ships. Um, this is uh, uh, sailing vessels in the Portland docks. Um, and this is the Grand Trunk Railroad in Portland in 1900. So, I mean, that's a lot of trains. And so you can see this, why printing did well here. <clears throat> so here's some, some images of some of the print shops. Um, uh, it's, it was a prime place for printing to thrive. This print shop is the, the print shop of the Sanford Weekly Ledger. The Ledger ran from 1892 to 1895 and later became the Sanford Tribune. So you can see those big old presses, those things weigh a lot. I should know, I've been moving them. Um, and, uh, and you can see in the picture the, uh, they would have probably been steam driven and they would have had a steam engine in the cellar or somewhere outside of this room and they would have run uh, um, a shaft, a, a rotating shaft into this room and you can see the pulleys up in the up there, up in the right or on the upper right a little bit. So so the shaft would come in and have pulleys on it, and the and the belts would come down and run the presses. <clears throat> um, or it was water driven. We do have a lot of water supply of dammed up uh, water that would drive these presses. Also, this is a, a photograph um, of the uh, Stephen Barry. Printer, print shop. It, this is at uh, 37 Plum Street in Portland, 1887. It's where the bank is now, one of the banks downtown. They tore all that stuff out. And so in this picture, it's uh, not only the Stephen Barry printer, but if you, you, you can't really read it from the slide, but um, there's a book binder also in the building, which is often what would what would happen. <clears throat> so this was right in Portland. Um, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people being, nine people being employed by Stephen Barry at least. 
This is the Tucker Book Card and Job Printing Office and uh, from 1859. It was located at 65 and 71 Exchange Street, Portland. It was burned in the, eight, in the fire of 1866 and was later replaced with a new brick structure for the First National Bank on the corner of Exchange and Middle Street. So what's there now? Tommy's Park, I think. There's still part of a bank there. Um, so this is a huge operation um, right downtown Portland. Then this is a, an example of <clears throat> Tucker's printing, um, the call to arms uh, for the Civil War. Um, and uh, this was a local poster that was, was just dis distributed locally. It was not national at all. Um, Sons of Maine to join the 12th Maine Regiment in the, f in the, in the fall of 1861. So Maine and Portland in particular has a long history of, of printing. Um, <clears throat> as does New England in general. And I think, I mean, Boston has had a lot of printers, famous printers out of Boston. And, but I think, I theorize in my mind that the reason there were printers in Boston was because they could get paper from Maine. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but I, I, I think I, it makes sense. So. Now I'm going to jump up a lot um, and uh, to more direct lineage uh, to Wolf Editions. Um, and I'm stretching it a bit here uh, because I, don't, I never met anybody who worked at this place. But this is the Marymount Press in Boston. And it was the beginning of the revival of fine printing in New England. So printing kind of went uh, cheap. It was like big factories and you know it was bad paper and bad type and and it was just kind of done quickly. And with the revival of fine printing in England at about the same time in New England we started to do the same thing. So um, the Marymount Press is a very famous Boston printer, um, and it was Dan, Dan, Daniel Berkeley Updike, and um, this is a picture of him. And he was among the f very few four or five printers at the time that really wanted to make printing better and wanted to when make. What was the time, David? What, when are you talking about? Uh, when would, Scott, when would Updike have been? Uh, the, t the teens up through the 40s, teens up through the 40s, just as a guess. Um, <clears throat> so you've got, uh, uh, so you've got the, the, the interest in fine printing growing. Um, and uh, we've, so this is some samples of the Marymount Press work. Um, these beautiful compositions of these title pages. Um, and, and he influenced many, many people. Uh, just that, that he was successful and he was doing fine printing and he was asking the question, how, you know, how can we make it better? How can we do this in a better way? And he wasn't looking backwards. So, so the printing the early, early, early printing was really beautifully done and very carefully done and, and, and it, it kind of went down. And he wasn't, he was reviving it, just the interest in fine printing. It wasn't, it wasn't, he wasn't trying to bring back the old days. Uh, he was trying to say, all right, we have new machines, new technologies, and we can make fine books with this and do a better job. There's, uh, this is Thomas Bird Mosier, and he's the, he was from Portland, and he was considered a publishing pirate. He didn't ask permission for 
uh, to, to publish people's works. He just, uh, it was kind of pr prior to copyright laws and actually many, a lot of the push to get copyright laws were caused, were, came about because the work that he had done and people were complaining about it. Um, and he was on Exchange Street. This is some of his work. So on Exchange Street, I, you know, this is right in Portland. Um, some of these beautiful uh, designs. Art Nouveau, I was trying to find that word. Uh, and so then, now we're going to get to a direct lineage for me and my friend Scott um, is, is Anthoenson Press. Now Anthoenson Press was a press that was on Exchange Street. Um, it, it originally had been on Franklin Street and the building burned and they moved into Exchange Street because they were just junk storefronts and they could get them cheap on Exchange Street. And <clears throat> Fred Anthoenson, this is him in 1940. He was a, a Portlander and, uh, and he started working at a place called the Southworth Press. Um, and again, he, he was looking at Marymount Press. The Marymount Press preceded him a bit. And he was looking at Marymount Press and saying, I, that's the work I want to do. I want to do really good work. So he started working at Southworth Press and then eventually bought it and turned it into the Anthoenson Press and, uh, and brought the level of printing in Portland up to a, a fine press level. Here's a, um, uh, a letterhead um, from that. And uh, so after the fire on Middle Street, it was moved to 37 Exchange Street. So this is when it was on Middle Street. And I could go on and show you tons of examples of this man's work, but um, I'll just show you this book that he wrote about types and bookmaking. Um, and at the time of this book publishing, it was 1943, it was called the Southworth Anthoenson Press. So he had bought it, but he, and he kept maintained the old name a little bit for a little while, and then he dropped the old name. I was hired by the Anthoenson Press. That's what brought me to Portland. Um, and I was, I had studied fine art printmaking in art school in Baltimore, but I wanted, I was really interested in this book printing thing, which I had, in art school I was not taught letterpress printing at all. Uh, and I came and swept the floor at Anthoenson Press and learned letterpress printing there. We had, uh, that business was based on linotype machines, so this is a rather gregarious linotype machine. Um, and this is about, this is about 4,000 pounds of cast iron and working parts. And I learned a lot there. I got, a, it, that place got me started on letterpress printing. And that's where I realized that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to make fine books, fine printing. Um, <clears throat> that place closed. Um, and the general manager at the time and I opened the Shagbark Press, which was in South Portland. So that's an early picture of me setting up something in one of the presses. Here's kind of a shot of the shop. So I was, <clears throat> it was me, Harry Milliken, who was the general manager of Anthoenson, and his wife, Gwen. And you can see in the background, that big double magazine linotype, the one in the background, and then the smaller one that Harry's operating there. Harry had worked at Anthoenson Press for, for 45 years, and um, they were closing the, the place, and he said, do you want to open another place? And I said, yeah. So we ran this for a while. Um, I won't show you like tons of pictures of things that we did, but we did, I've showed this one because it's local. 
the Tate House um, in 1991. What, what year did Ann Collinson close? Oh. Roughly? 87. 87, yeah. So <clears throat> Harry wanted to retire. Uh, and we wanted to sell the business because he was going to retire. And I got a job offer at, at another place to work. And my friend Scott Vile bought the, the, the press from us. Um, and so Scott's press, he, he named it the Essentius Press, and, uh, and I, went, we, you know, I went off to, to work at the Steinauer Press. So you can start to see these, this line of, you can see this line of people that, now, you know, it's a lineage, we're not, we're not related we're only we're related because we're all printers, and we you know I never met Fred Anthonson. I worked at his shop, shop, but he had died by the time I worked there. But I feel related to him. Um, I did work with Harry Millick, and and I felt like he was you know a father figure to me. So there there is this non-familiar thing that that is this chain of of people going forward. Um, so I went to work at the Steinauer Press, uh, which is a fairly well-known printing establishment um, in Vermont. And um, I'm, that's not me in that picture, but I kind of looked like that earlier. But, um, this is the composition room. The Steinauer Press produced thousands of books over the years. They started in 1950 and they closed in 98 or something like that, somewhere in there. This, going, this is a book produced for the Grolier Club and the Houghton Library printed by the Steinauer Press, a book about the Marymount Press. It's a little it's a little too much, but <laughs> here's another title page of a book that they did, beautiful composition, 1994. The Steinauer Press used a, a different kind of composition machine, um, which is called a, a, a monotype machine. This is a weird picture of one. And so when I decided to leave there. They were, that place was closing. I don't think these places all closed because I worked there. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. Um, so that place was closing, and I moved back to Portland, worked for Scott for a little while, and then just opened up my own studio again. And when the Steinauer Press completely closed, they asked me if I wanted to buy, if I wanted to buy their composition department. So that was, it was one, two, three, four, five composition machines. This thing weigh, this thing looks small, but it, that weighs about, I don't know, 2,000 pounds? 2,500, yeah. So now we get up to, I, you know, so I had had a print shop in Portland called Shagbark Press. But then I come back and I start Wolf Editions. So here it is. <laughs> it's in the Calderwood building. Um, I know this looks like the whole building's buried completely in snow, but the embankment goes up there. <laughs> but it was a lot of snow. My interest in, I have a strong interest in fine art, and I've always had that. And so my shop combines fine art with the typography. Um, and there are some other, there are other uh, uh, letterpress shops around, fairly close, and everybody has their own kind of niche. And, uh, and, and they've got um, my friend Pilar, uh, who is running the, um, is she here? Yes. <laughs> In, in Portland, she's, a, she's running the Pickwick Press, uh, independent press, and that's more of a, of a uh, 
access, open access, or you know, community print shop. And Scott's, I, I, don't, I can't describe everybody's place, but Scott's shop has a certain niche, and my shop has a niche, and you know, we try not to step on each other's toes. We try not to. So uh, the inside of the shop, this black and white photograph just looks like it's all one big machine. Um, but it's on, it's at 61 Pleasant Street. Um, here is Crystal running the Wessel Iron Hand Press. I forget what she was printing. Um, and we have big cylinder presses, with, which are hand crank. There's some pictures of some big pieces of wood type that somebody was printing at some point. So I've been printing in Portland for almost 40 years, which it just scares me. <laughs> um, but it's been one, th one place and another place and another place. It's not, but I've been at Wolf Editions for 20 something. So, um, so some of the work that I do, I, rather than having shown you pictures of my work this whole time, I'm trying to give you a history. We've done a lot of posters for the, the Tides Institute up in Eastport. We have a strong, I've had a strong connection uh, to them. And uh, so these are, <coughs> these are posters that are, you know, 20 inches tall and this one's probably 12 inches wide. And it's wood cut, so uh, the, the word Eastport and the port of is cut in a plank of wood, as well as the, the picture of the ship, and as well as the solid piece of wood that, that is the, the gradation. Um, and then it's a little hard to see in this light, but there's um, lead type, a para two paragraphs at the bottom, explaining about how the port of Eastport is over 100 feet tall at the dock and how they can uh, pull uh, container ships, huge container ships up right, the, down, the, the downtown docks, they can just pull right up there. Um, and so how do, you, how, do you how do you explain that visually is just, is that was my answer. So uh, the Tides Institute has done a lot of, of um, uh, workshops. So this was a workshop uh, about photography where they took the, a room in the, in the museum and closed off all the windows and put a pinhole in the, in the closure and it projects the image of the outside into the inside. This is a, a poster about the St. Croix Island which is in the St. Croix River which divides Canada and the United States up in uh, near Eastport, and uh, in, in, the, in 1604, the French came and saw this island. It's, re it's really out in the middle of the river. It's a huge river, and it's, and it's got fresh water coming down and salt water coming in, and they thought this island would be great to, to colonize, to, to, to land there and build a little town there. Um, because it, they could defend it. And they did that, they brought all the stuff that they needed, the building materials they built there, they settled in for the winter, and in the winter, the ice comes down the river and builds up on the side of, and they couldn't get off the island and they ran out of water. And the c coloration on the left is kind of a symbol that it was, um, it was like, 50 to 60 percent of the population died of scurvy the first winter. So, and so it's just a poster telling that. <coughs> Sardine, maple leaf. So these are combinations of woodcuts of my design and metal type, typographic elements. Eastport Salmon Festival. So we do these posters. We do books. This is um, Allison Hildreth's um, Imagery, who is a local artist, and Jonathan Altridge, who is a local poet. The work that I'm 
coming out of is mostly book work. So at, at Enthoenson Press and at, at Shagbark Press and Steinauer Press and Essentius Press, we did book work mostly. In the last 15 years, there's been hardly any book work, so we branch off into other things. Um, but we're seeing more interest in the book work coming back. So we're pushing, my son and I are pushing back into that. So we're going to be doing more of that. Um, but some of the other things that we've done, uh, you know, a, 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 a wrapper for a CD, mu a music CD. Remember that music used to come on these things? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, certificates. For, I mean, this is the Baxter Society, which is a local um, book collecting uh, group. Uh, and so, and... <clears throat> not so much now, but in the past have done things like wedding invites and things like that. So one aspect of what, we, what I've done is teaching. So this was a this is bad color. Um, this is a group, uh, this is a master class from uh, Bowdoin College. And these are uh, art students at Bowdoin that came. And the woman holding... The print was, is a fairly well-known artist, and she came, and the class all together in my studio made this, the print with her, so they could learn that. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's you got to teach. You've got to. Uh, I don't, I don't teach full time, but I teach as much as I can. Um, uh, so. One, another aspect that, we've, that I've done at Wolf Editions is to have one-on-one -on -one teaching situations. So um, this was my first master printer training program. Some people get really wiggy about you know, the, the name master printer. And they're like, well, who are you to call somebody a master printer? And who, whoever called you a master printer? I don't know. But um, so... There's Lisa Pixley, <laughs> and she, wa she worked in the shop for three years, I think, to, to, to learn technically how to print, but also how to, to learn to work with other people. Because as a, in the fine art printing field, a master printer is somebody who is a technician who works with the artist and helps the artist to realize their goal of what they want to make and and so to do that job you have to understand people you have to know when to make a suggestion and know when to back off and let let them make their mistakes um, or whatever you know it, so it's so um, so it, it was there was some technical training involved, but a lot of it was just working with uh, other artists. One of the artists that we've been working with for a long time now is Charlie Hewitt, um, and he lives in Portland, and we do a lot of work for him. We've been working for him for a long time. There's a picture. No, that's not Charlie. That's Charlie up there. That's fearsome. <laughs> so... Um, so that's one thing that we've done. And Pilar, and I'm sorry, Pilar, I don't have a picture of you. <laughs> but she's right there. She's right there. And Pilar came and worked for a number of years in the shop as in the master printer training program. So in the old guild system, which printing was, that's how printing was taught and how it was organized. Uh, you'd have an apprentice, and you'd be a journeyman, and you'd work your way up, and you'd become a master. And a master was somebody who had their own place. That's really all it meant. I mean, so, somebody who knew what they were doing, but you could have a really, really skilled journeyman, but they weren't a master until they had their own place, until till they were the boss. And so both of the people that have done this program have their own place. Pilar has Pickwick. And Lisa has print craft up on, 
uh, Danforth Street. Um, and so it, I'm really proud of those people having done that and going out and both of them doing something uh, on their own and becoming masters in their own right. Because we have these two-ton machines that we have to move around all the time, and people give them to you. They say, here, take them. Uh, you've got to come get them. They're up on the fourth floor. <laughs> but we've learned, you know, we learn how to move stuff. And so we get called, I get called to move big equipment. Tomorrow I'm going to Connecticut and pick up an etching press and bring it up and deliver it to Bowdoin. So uh, just for hire. Um, and so other things come about. So Scott, somebody contacted Scott a little while ago, wanted to use a printing, an old printing press for a movie. And Scott was like, yeah, well, I think David Wolf's got the one you want. <laughs> so, he, so they called me, and I was like, yeah, I don't have too much going on right now. Let's, we'll do it. So they came up, they sent, I was like, well, who is, who is this? You know, I said, I, I think I told them I wanted to be paid in advance. Because, you know, I figured some college situation where somebody's making a movie. And it turns out it was, uh, it was Sony Pictures. It was Little Women, the, production, the new production of Little Women, which will come out at Christmas. And they wanted a printing press. They, they set up a whole set that was... A, a, time, the, you know, from the time period, and they needed some actual printing presses, and they wanted somebody that could actually run the printing press and actually print. So I kind of got pulled into it, but it was kind of exciting. So we, we packed up one, two, three iron hand presses from the mid, date, dating from the mid-1800s, plus a type cabinet and a bunch of other stuff. They sent a truck up. They picked it all up, took it down to Franklin, Massachusetts, and set it up in a, in a studio, a big, huge studio. And so that's, and then they dressed me up. And uh, so I, I don't know if I'm going to be in the movie or not, but parts, my hands might be. My hands might be. So we, you know, I keep my mind open to different things to do. Um, plus, this paid so much I couldn't not do it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sony. Um, so, you know, it's, I've always tried to keep the doors open and keep my mind open to doing what seems interesting. Because if I just sat there and printed, you know, <coughs> raffle tickets for the rest of my life, I'd go berserk. So, my son, Sean, who is right there, um, decided that he wanted to do this. He wanted to, to continue in this lineage. And it's ironic that the lineage up to this point hasn't been through my family at all. But, at least the one that I'm picturing in my mind. But, now, it, well, it is. It is. And so this is a picture of a studio that we set up up in Eastport. Well, the, the, we moved in before the real estate situation was settled. And it got sold out from underneath us. So we moved up there. He moved, we started moving up there two years ago. And then we just moved it back to Portland. And um, so back in Portland. And we're working together. And uh, you know, I think, you know, I think he's gonna do some great things. And his his approach is different than mine. Um, but it's you know, the the ball's moving into his court, so it's it's up to him to figure out how this stuff goes forward from here, um, you know, I'll help as long as I can. So, you know, here we are, back in Portland. 
And that's all I got. Oh, Scott. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the, the interesting things that I was just thinking about with lineage is the fact that um, last year when I moved, I started remelting a lot of the lead that I have. And it's interesting that you and I now own the lead from Steinauer, Anthos, and Shag Bark, Sun Hill Press, and Fire right. Press. We, we have probably 15 or 20 tons of hot lead, right. hot metal, that we use to print books from. And this is continually recycled. So we have the lead that's been used to print all the books over the last 125 years from these fine presses. It's true. I hadn't thought of that. But yeah. I mean, I, you know, when, when I'm in the shop and I got people watching me, we're, we're casting type, and we take the old slugs that, the, that, we've, that we're done printing from and we put them into the pot and they melt. And I always tell them it's the old, the, the old ideas being melted into new ideas. And that's, I, you know, you're right, the, the metal itself goes back a long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, Jay. Uh, I have a question because you didn't talk at all about it. And I, you know, I don't know that much about printing except that I met you and I think I met Scott when you guys were both in at Enthones and I was upstairs working in main color service, mm -hmm. two floors above you. And my first experience with letterpress was seeing all the guys standing on the sidewalk smoking and drinking <laughs> coffee in their ink stained yeah. aprons. And what is the connection between ink and print? Uh, the, 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 I mean, really, quite frankly, did the printing presses change the development of ink? Or what it's, is no, it's, it's really ink, 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 ink and printing and drinking. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it has to do with the drinking. But, I mean, how did, did, did the creation of presses change? The, because ink obviously was around well before that. Well, the, uh, all right, so Gutenberg, one of the things that Gutenberg other than the press, the movable type it, the, was ink. He, he did develop, you know, the, the, some of the ink, you know, he changed paint into ink. And, and you, you, you make ink a different way for different kinds of printing. So etching ink is very oily, but really full of a lot of pigment. Printing ink has a lot of varnish in it and less pigment. Um, you know, paint has, has no varnish. It's, it's almost like mayonnaise. So it is. And, and so, you know, the, yes, when printing, so when they, so Gutenberg, I wish I knew more about Gutenberg, but, uh, you know, when he decided we we're going to use movable type and he came up with a press for making the impression. He also had to come up with a, an ink that would, you know, how do I get the ink onto that raised surface? Because you're printing from the raised surface. And how do, I, how do I make it sticky so it sticks? And, you know, how do I make it go into the paper? All of that changed as technology changed, as paper changed. You know, the, the, the you know, originally they were printing on skins you know, uh, uh, you know, animal skin. So it would change as the materials they were using changed, but um, it all developed at the same, at basically at the same time. We have a press, Sean and I have a press that's, he's gone, uh, that's over 200 years old and, the, and it um, was developed by this man named John Wells. So the Original presses were a, a screw press, so it's a great big giant screw in the middle and you grab hold of the handle and pull and it just turns part way and it pushes the platen down and makes the impression. So John Wells, he, John Wells was an ink maker and they had presses for crushing um, flax, no, what's it, uh, linseed for making linseed oil, so for pressing linseed oil, and, and it was a toggle. So you, you, take, you take a bent toggle and you straighten it out and it's pushing down. So he took the, that idea from pressing linseed and applied it to making a, 
printing press and made a, a printing press that was something like 80 times stronger than the screw press. Um, so there are all these developments and so then, you know, somebody comes up with a different kind of paper and then somebody's got to, got to make the, the ink doesn't quite work the same and so they got to, it, it all worked together. They were, it, printing press was like the, the invention of the printing press was like the invention of the airplane or like the invention of the computer. There are these really major, or the invention of the linotype machine. They're really major things that changed how much, how, how, how much the knowledge was spread. So you, you go from setting type where you have to take one piece out of, a, out of a case, put it in, and you're going like this. Well, then you come up with a machine where you go pop, 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 and you're typing it, and it's making the lead type as you type it. And it's 13 to 15 times faster. Well, it's 13 to 15 times more information that goes out and educates the world. Where can somebody see a lot of your work, or anyone's work? Asensius, I mean, does the library collect uh, some of the work, or do, God forbid, folks ever have submissions? <laughs> <laughs> for, for those of us, uh, I mean, I've always loved letterpress. I've had very little mm -hmm. contact with it, and just to see. There are exhibitions here and there. Um, uh, yes? Uh, the print room at Bowdoin is pretty good yeah. um, source. Um, A lot of our work is up at Bowdoin. Yeah. And so if you know what you want to look at, or you, you don't know, you can always talk to one of the reference librarians um, and make a selection of things which they can then bring out. It may be a two-step process. They might can't show up mm -hmm. one day and have them pull it all out. But and it's... At the library, the print room at the library? No. Uh, it, the, it's called the Rare Book Room, oh, yeah. Rare Book Collection, yeah, at Bowdoin College. And it's in the library, second floor. And yeah, they, they have a have pretty it. active... Um, yeah. yeah. And the Portland Museum has a book arts collection, which is mostly artist books, but a lot of them involve printing. Um, yeah. And by the both University of, these gentlemen. of Southern and Maine has... And University of Southern Maine. So we have lots of resources, actually. Um, but you have to kind of... Um, the, as far as my own work, um, we have a gallery space that's in the building where we are. And it, the, the shows switch out, but I'm, I usually put up a show once a year at least. Um, I'm open to visitors if they call ahead and make an appointment. Um, I have thousands and thousands of pieces of p paper <laughs> that people can look at. And I, you know, if I get, you know, if I can schedule it so that, it, you know, I, I'm open to people coming to see the shop. It also makes me think about the, the work of the printer, and that is, you know, do you have a copy of everything you're, we're supposed to. Um, you know, I think different printers do things. Some, print, some printers make sure they ha still have one of everything they've ever done. I'm not that careful. Um, and my career has gone up and down. And I've worked in some places where the product that I'd have a sample of was worth some money and I needed to pay rent. So um, I sold my, so, sort of my early collection of stuff that I had done before Wolf Editions to, um, to Colby. Now, I don't know what, there was a gentleman up there collecting um, fine printers from Maine, uh, and, but he's gone now. So I don't know what that collection, you know, what they've done with that collection. But um, yeah, it was for the library. Yeah, but um, I have a lot of I I in trying to find images for this talk, I was looking for some of the stuff that I printed. I was involved in printing at Anthelinson Press, and I I don't have any more. I I got rid of it. 
like all those quarterly publications, a lot of the work that Ann Thoenson did was quarterly publications. So we were printing, um, you know, a hundred, hundred and twenty, thirty page book four times a year, and we had five or six of those when I started. It was a lot. And that's a lot. That's a lot of typesetting. All those, all those pages typeset by with a with a machine, but all in lead. And it was years and years and years of, of the American Oxonian. Well, Scott has all those now. I don't know if he's, you're still keeping them, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Type changes with the technology that is, it's being seen on and, and, um, and the sensibility, you know, the, 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 the basic sensibility behind it changes also. Um, you know, when, when Gutenberg made the Bible, uh, the, he, he used black letter, what I call black letter, um, the Gothic, you know, text black letter. And, and they would, you know, you know what I'm talking about, that kind of type? So a lot of people call it German type. It looks very German. Um, well, people who read, that was what they were used to reading, and they could read that very nicely, very fluently. And their, how they learned to read was with that type. And when they started using Roman typefaces as, like we are used to, they couldn't read them. They had trouble reading them. So, um, but that changed. People got more used to the Roman, and now people have trouble reading the black letter. And even a step further than that, um, you know, I have trouble reading a book on a computer, but my kids, well, not my kids, but kids <laughs> have trouble reading a book and can, can much prefer to read it on a, on a, on a computer. So it, we change. We, we have changed as much as the technology has changed. And um, I'm not saying it's for better or worse. I don't know. Uh, there's, you know, we're, we, get, we get information a lot faster now. I don't know if that's good. But, you know, we, it, who knows? I, you know, when, when they started, when they went from, setting type by hand, when they went from writing books by hand with a pen to typesetting it, picking the ones out one at a time, people thought it was the devil's work. They, they thought it was, I thought they thought the end of the world was near, and literally. And, uh, and then the same thing happened when the typesetting was being done by hand and they came up with a machine that would go 15 times faster they thought that was the end of the world. And, and the computer is the same way. Um, and then the computer to, the, to this, this ridiculous thing. Um, you know, that's another step from this. <laughs> and, what, and what's the next step? I, I don't know. I, there's no, I don't think one's better or worse than the other. It's just you've got to have an understanding of it.